Hello Calvary, welcome to our home. My name is Keith and this is my amazing wife Angie. Even though we're not able to gather together in person today, I would like you to join us in worshiping God as one body. And even though the church building is closed, God still uses Calvary to do amazing things around our community. If you'd like more information on how you can get involved, please go to our website at calvary.church slash stay connected. Parents, don't forget, after the 9 a.m. service every week, there's a fun kids program that's been put together by our children ministry team. It's so much fun. We dance, we sing, and we learn about Jesus. In a few seconds, we will begin worship. Grab your family, and we hope you have a blessed time. We miss you all, and we hope to see you soon. So I run 
Hey, church fam, Chris here. Hope you're doing well. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, uh, I wanted to draw our attention to a scripture, and it's out of Psalm 59, and it's verses 16 and 17. And it says this, But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress the God who shows me steadfast love. I love that verse. Um, God is our fortress. God is our rock. God is our refuge. And his steadfast love endures forever. In light of that good truth, let's continue to worship.
Hi, my name is Kyle Howard, and I serve out at the Big Creek campus. It's great to get to be here with you this morning. And man, I don't know about you, but one of the things that's really blessed me for the past few months has been um, being able to meet in a small group. And for Brian Ernst, who attends our campus, I just want to share this testimony that he gives. While the quarantine period has been unfortunate and at times challenging for me, I've been super blessed to be able to meet virtually with our small group. With just working as a police officer on nights, I instantly became a stay-at-home dad with a seven-month-old who was also working full-time supporting students, teachers, and administration in my role at school. While work meetings were productive, I always felt distracted and judged as I wrestled Eli amidst the conversations. Small group was different. Encouragement is a mainstay in our group, as is empathy. I looked forward to those moments because I could be real with my struggles without feeling like it was a complaint session. No one added to my stress or compounded my hardship with other things to consider. I took for granted many things prior to the spread of coronavirus. Small group was one of them. While I know I'll settle back into a routine as normalcy returns, I plan to continue to treasure small group as it truly was a lifeline for me as I juggled my responsibilities. It was so encouraging to turn to my small group when a family matter arose. The text back and the follow-up have exemplified the tightness of our group. Ultimately, I am thankful for Calvary and the commitment to the community as demonstrated by their efforts, both large and small. God is doing great things in our church, and I am excited to be a small part of the bigger picture. So, man, big shout out to all of you who have, uh, man, leading small groups, uh, whether it's youth, adults, whatever, um, just making an intentional effort to connect with people. Uh, it matters. It makes a difference. And we are so thankful for the time that you have given over the last so many months. And uh, right now is the time in our service where we're going to be taking our offering. And so, man, for all of you that are giving and offering up prayers, uh, offering up finances, uh, offering up time and serving with the gifts and abilities that God has given you, man, I just want to say thank you so much for giving all of those things uh, to God in worship uh, and his mission as we uh, seek to be the faithful uh, local church that God has called us to be. Man, blessings to you guys, and uh, we'll see you soon. Well, the other day I was doing some COVID cleaning and came across the Bible that I had when I was a teenager. And it was fascinating opening it up and just looking at some of the marks and notes that I made back then. And I remember one night I was at a low point in my teen years, just really feeling isolated and alone and not at peace. And I opened up the Bible, something you shouldn't do, but I just open it up and it fell to John 15, verse 15. And it says this, no longer do I call you slaves for the slave does not know what his master is doing but I have called you friends. And that was life changing. I mean, in that moment, everything in my relationship with God, it changed. Because I realized that I was not just a slave of God. It was not about duty. Christianity was not just about trying to get it out and please God, that it was about a friendship. Jesus said, I want to be your friend. And in a moment when I needed a friend, Jesus said, I want to be your friend. And that's the power of God's word. It can change a life in an instant. It can change an attitude in a moment. It can change a family. It can change a community. It can change a neighborhood. It can change a hurt or a church. It can change a country. The God's word is so powerful. In fact, that's what makes this book so dangerous, that people understand the living power that there is in the authority of God's Word. In fact, in some countries in the world today, the most dangerous thing you can do is have a Bible. You may not be persecuted for being a Christian, but you may be persecuted for having a Bible in your possession. And so today, that's what we want to talk about, the dangerous power of hope that comes from the Word of God. And what we want to see today is that hope It comes at the intersection of interacting with God's Word and suffering for God's Word. Right there in the middle comes hope. So I invite you to turn to 1 Thessalonians 
We're going to look at a few verses in chapter two. And we started a few weeks ago looking at this book, just making our way through it, recognizing this is the very first book of the New Testament. It's the first book that Paul wrote. It was written to a church Paul had only visited for about three weeks. After three weeks, he was smuggled out of town because it was so dangerous for him to be there. About a year later, he sends Timothy back to find out how the church is doing. And when he does, he hears such great reports. And he says, you're a model church. You're a model of faith, of hope, and of love. And it makes you wonder, how did they do that? How, with just a few weeks of Paul, did they become such a model church? And we saw it last week, Pastor Chad shared that part of that was through the ministry that Paul had, just in three weeks, the powerful personal ministry that we can have to change lives. And today we want to look at just the power of God's Word, how God's Word can inspire hope in us. And so here Paul's going to talk about two things, interacting with God's word and suffering for God's word. And what we're going to see first is that interacting with God's word, it instills hope in us. It inspires hope. It inculcates hope within our life. And this is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. He says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. And here Paul talks about interacting with the word of God. And he's so excited, right, about what God's word has done. And we see, first of all, that what the church did is that they received God's word. They heard it. The word receive it means kind of like listen with your ears. It's kind of the idea of when UPS comes to your door and they bring a package and maybe you have to sign for it, you what? Receive it. When there's something in the mail, you pick it up, you receive it. You take it. You may not embrace it, but you receive it. You don't argue. You don't say it's not mine. You don't push it back. You receive it. And this is what Paul's excited about. Any teacher is excited. When someone listens and they don't argue, they don't resist, they just kind of receive and go, that's that's something I need to hear. But they just didn't receive it. Because sometimes that's all we do. We go, oh, that's nice. That's good to hear. That, that's kind of a neat thing. But what did they do? Secondly, they accepted it. They received it and they accepted it. In fact, the word there for accept, it really means to welcome, that they welcomed God's word, they internalized it. In fact, to receive means kind of listen with your ears, to accept means to listen with your heart, to welcome and accept it. They internalized it. They said, this is valuable. I need this. I've got to incorporate it into my life. I'm going to listen with my heart. Now, sometimes the biggest distance is between our head and our heart. Those 18 inches, it's kind of the most resistant distant distance in the world. And, and sometimes there are people who right, just kind of hear God's word, but they ignore it. But then at times we need to welcome it and receive it and internalize it and invite it into our life. And when we do that, Paul says, it's at work in us. I love that word. It's at work. It means it's bearing fruit. It's fruitful. It's the same kind of work that speaks uh, about a farmland that creates a bumper crop or about an oil well that produces a gusher or, or about amazing returns on your investment, that it's at work in you. And here's what Paul says. There's two ways for God's work to be at work. Let me ask, do you sense God's word at work in you? Is God's word making a difference? Is it alive? Is it functioning? Is it producing something? And that comes from a combination of hearing it with your head and welcoming it with your heart. And sometimes what happens is that we just hear, right? We hear God's word, but we don't welcome it. That's why people can go to church forever and ever and not be changed by it. That's why people can go to church and hear God's word and not ever respond to it. It has to be welcomed. Sometimes what happens is that people welcome little bits of God's word. They hear the parts that they like, or they welcome a few things, or they focus on a few areas of God's word, and they welcome that, they invite that, that's their life, and that's what they're going to get. But they're not kind of continually receiving God's word. And Paul says, what's at work in us? What produces something in us is when we have a constant diet of hearing and receiving God's word and then welcoming it. And notice what happens. In order to do that, we have to see God's word as what? As the word of God. Paul says to the Thessalonians, you didn't receive it just as words of men, even though Paul says we delivered it, you heard it from us. You received it as what? The word of God. Let me ask you, how do you see the scriptures? How do you see the Bible? 
right? Sometimes we just see uh, the Bible is just nice words, it's nice phrase, it's good teaching, it's history. Sometimes we see it as, as something that we just need to go to to get a little bit of encouragement. Uh, sometimes we listen to it for just what we want to hear and we filter it through the things that make sense. We go to God's word to kind of prove what we already believe that we know. Is it God's word? When you open it up, when you open up God's word, is it his word to you? Is it have his authority as you're speaking? When you open up, are you eager to say, hey, God, speak to me, teach me something, enliven my heart, fill me with something that's there. And so many times in our culture, I think we have so many books and so much wisdom that we just add the scripture as, a, as another piece. It's just something nice in here for it to be at work. And we wonder, why is it not at work? It has to be the word of God, God speaking and shaping us. And sometime, maybe you're here, maybe you're not sure about Christianity or not sure about the Bible and you go, but the Bible was written by humans, it was. But notice what happened, God inspired it. It's his word, it's written by humans. When God needed someone to kind of write the life and sayings of Jesus. He raised up human Matthew to do that. When God needed someone to speak to the church, he raised up Paul to, to write exhortations to the church. God raised up men, but who made sure that it was his word. And if you need hope, this is where it is, because this is God's word. Interacting with God's word is what brings us hope. Because when do we need hope? We sometimes need hope when we think, what, things will never change. Nothing's ever going to get better. It's always going to be this way. And the Word of God gives us hope that God's going to renew things. We read in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. That there's something about God's Word that brings hope and change. Sometimes we need hope when we don't know where to go, when we need a little bit of guidance. In God's word, it brings us hope because God says, I'm going to guide you. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, your word, God, is a lamp for my feet. It's a light for my path. God's word, it's a lamp. It may not show us everything we need to do, may not sure show us all the directions, but it's enough just to show one step at a time. God, just show me one step at a time. Here's my next step. God's word, it promises. You need hope of direction in your life this will give it to you. Sometimes we're just confused. We're not sure what's going on. We're not sure how we can understand ourselves. And the Bible gives us wise counsel. It's hope, right? Psalm 119 verse 24, your statues are my delight. They are my counselors. You need wisdom. You need some counsel. This is it. Go to God's word. Here's where hope is found. Sometimes we know something's wrong, right? Something needs to change. Something's wrong in our life and we don't know where to go. This is what gives us also judgment of what's right and wrong. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart that this is judges, it tells me what's right, what's wrong. Now we love this in somebody else. We want God's word to judge somebody else. In fact, sometimes that's what we do. We use God's word as a weapon to judge somebody else. And in fact, it's there to judge us, to show us what's right, show us what's wrong, show us what needs to change. And in fact, if you're not interacting with God's word and there's no judgment, then you have to ask yourself, am I interacting in the right way? If God's word is not challenging you, calling you to something, pointing out things in your life and not change, you're probably not interacting. You're probably not letting it be the word of God in your life. Because this is what God's word does. It inspires us and changes us. And that change gives us hope. You probably heard the story of Mutiny on the Bounty, where the ship's Sailors, they mutinied against Captain Bly and set him adrift in a boat. And they went on and lived their lives. You probably don't know the rest of the story. That they gather some wives from some Tahitian islands and they eventually settled on Pitcairn Island. And there on Pitcairn Island, they lived just as they wanted to. They lived kind of a rebellious life. They were drinking all the time. They were stealing all the time. In fact, they were fighting with one another all the time. That one by one, many of the people were dying and the population was shrinking. Until one day, when one man, Alexander Smith, found a trunk. It was a trunk that his mom had on the ship. And he opened up the trunk and there in the trunk was a Bible. And he picked it up and he read it. And it was not the word of God, 
or sorry, it was not the word of men to him. He heard it and he read it as the word of God. And in an instant, it changed his life. And then he read it to the other people on the island and it changed their lives. And there was such a community change. When the island was rediscovered later, there was no need for a prison in the Nile, on that island. This was an island where they were murdering one another at one time. There wasn't even a prison because they were living according to God's principles. It had completely changed them. That's the hope we have, that real living dynamic hope of life. It's found when we interact with this word. So reading God's word, uh, it's really deep in my relationship with uh, Christ, um, just hearing the truth and knowing that that is true. I've been a Christian for most of my life, and it's really awakened uh, an affection for him that I've never really had because it's helped me see him a little bit more clearly, living out that truth, you know, not wondering what is right, but just, you know, okay, I know that this is what God says. And um, just being reminded that Christ uh, has given me a new life through his death, through his resurrection, uh, strengthened just by God's firm hands, his gentle but firm hands that shape me by uh, his truth. Well, that's the power of God's word. When we interact with it, it gives us hope. Let me ask you, how is God's word giving you hope? Maybe you just want to share with other people on Facebook or YouTube. Just write down what verse is giving you hope right now. How are you interacting with God's word to inspire hope? But maybe as you're listening, you're going, you know what? It's been a long time since God's word really brought forth fruit, since I really felt the encouragement or hope from it. And if that's you, then maybe you have to ask yourself, are the ways that I'm interacting with it helpful? Are the ways that I'm interacting with it uh, the right ways? Maybe I need to change that up. Paul says here, when we interact with God's word, it inspires hope in us. And then he says, though, when we've interacted with God's word, we're gonna suffer because of it. But in that suffering, that's where hope is sustained. And notice what he goes on to say to these people who have received God's word and it's inspired them. He says in verse 14, for you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same thing those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to everyone. And then their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come on them at last. And Paul says, even though he rejoices, right, that they received God's word, he knows that they suffered from it because he suffered. And this is what happens. Paul would often go into a new city like Thessalonica. And as he was there, he would share with the Jewish people, uh, in particular, the good news of Jesus and how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament promises. And some of those Jewish people would become Christians. But what was happening in Thessalonica is some of the other Jewish people became angry and upset. How could Paul do that? And tried to stop Paul and tried to stop the other new Christians at Thessalonica from doing that and making it difficult. And Paul says, this is not new. This is exactly what happened in Jerusalem when the church began. And the Jewish people became angered at these new Christians, tried to persecute them and stop them from sharing the gospel. Now, notice how Paul says here, I want you to know that I'm rejoicing that you received the word. Now, think about it. He rejoiced even though the word brought persecution. Why? Because this is how he knew that God's word was at work in them. And many commentators think that this uh, is a reference back to a parable that Jesus told in Matthew. It's called the parable of the sowers or the parable of the soils and how a farmer went and scattered seed on different types of soil. And some, the gospel took root and others it didn't. And, and in one soil, it didn't take root. And here's how Jesus explained it in Matthew 13, verse 20 and 21. He said, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, it lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And here's what Jesus said, that there's sometimes we hear the word of God and interact with it. But if it's not taken deep root, when persecution comes, right, we walk away. I bet you've known some of those people that they got excited about church. They thought Jesus was the greatest thing, but difficulty came in their life and it didn't answer all their questions or their life wasn't perfect like what they wanted to and they just kind of walked away in their faith. This was not the Thessalonians. The word of God had taken deep root. That's why Paul could rejoice. And even in the midst of persecution, their hope endured. 
it endured. And Paul reminds us here that persecution is going to come when we interact with God's word. Of course, we want to think we're just going to be uh, happy, fun, successful Christians. We just want the word of God. We want to be kind of hip and we want to in- enjoy the benefits of this world and add a little bit of faith to it and, and everybody get along. But if you're going to become like Christ, if the word of God is forming Jesus in you, you're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be isolated because people do not like like the image of God. They don't want people becoming like Christ. And that goes against kind of everything that preachers sometimes say, right, in our world, that preachers say, well, you come to Jesus, you're going to be happy and successful and wealthy, and life is going to be great. You're going to have your best life now. You're going to have a great life, but it's a countercultural life. And there's going to be persecution because when you take Jesus, you take up the cross. We have to sometimes take up the cross and follow him. And that means we take up an instrument of suffering. And here's the challenge. In our world, right, as Christians, we have to talk about the cross. That means we can't be just blind optimists. We can't just say, oh, everything's going to be okay. Praise the Lord anyway. It's always going to be okay. But because of Jesus, we are also people of the resurrection. And we just can't also say, well, everything's terrible and and God's just got to wipe this world out and and that things just will never get better until Jesus comes. We're not optimists. We're not pessimists. We're not optimists because of the cross or pessimists because of the resurrection. We have to become what? A new kind of people. We have to be people of hope. People of hope who know because of our future, we're bringing hope to today. Now, how does that work? How does persecution and difficulty today inspire hope in us? N.T. Wright in his book, Uh, but surprised by hope. He writes it this way, Jesus is risen, therefore his followers have a new job to do. And what is that new job? It's to bring the life of heaven to earth, an actual physical earthly reality. Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. And what does N.T. Wright say? He says that we have the promise that Jesus is coming back. He's going to restore all things. He's going to make everything new. And because we have that promise, we just don't hold out and we just don't live now the way we any way that we want thinking oh well one day God's going to bring it true we start living out the promises of heaven now Jesus taught us to pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven what's God's will in heaven we need to be living that out on earth We need to be loving as we will love in heaven. We need to be instruments of peace as there will be peace in heaven. We need to have the justice of heaven. If there's any time, just in the last few weeks, with with the horrible ways that people have treated one another in our culture and the the racism and the ageism and the, the sexism and everything that's there, we men and women, we as people of hope need to bring justice to our world and live that way. And that what we do in our life today, it matters. How are you? How are you living out the values of heaven today on this earth? Wright goes on to say it this way. He says, the resurrection means that what we do in the present in working hard for the gospel is not wasted. It's not in vain. It will be completed. It will have its fulfillment in God's future. What we do isn't wasted. Let me give you an analogy. How does that work itself out? It's kind of like this, like a train. And that the engine of a train is our confident expectation that Jesus will return because he came once and gave his life. He's going to come again and he's going to rule the earth. He's going to bring heaven again to this earth. He's going to restore creation here. Sometimes we think heaven is just out there. That is an intermediary state. When Jesus Christ returns and comes in fulfillment, he's going to bring heaven here. In all justice, it will be done. Every wrong, it will be righted. That Jesus is going to confidently finish the work that he started to do. In fact, he even says this here, that those who were thwarting the gospel and persecuting, they're going to experience judgment and wrath. That's the engine. The cars of our train is us living that now because that's the engine that drives us. We're going to live that now. We're going to pray now. We're going to worship now. We're going to live in joy now. We're going to share the word of Jesus now. We're going to share the gospel with others. We're going to live just in the love of God. We're going to live in the justice of God. We're going to live in the truth and the hope of God, even in the midst of difficulty, even when it doesn't make sense, even when the world doesn't want us to do that. Today, we live hope. We live today as if we were living in the future. We're going to live out that hope. 
And that's what's inspiring to people, right? That's what inspires us. When we see people living counterculturally in the midst of persecution, living well, when they're forgiving, when they have no reason to forgive or it's difficult to forgive, when they're loving, even people that are sometimes a challenge and a difficulty to love, when they're walking in peace, even when the world is falling apart, when they're living heaven today, that inspires us. And you may say, well, I could live that way if I had feelings. If I could feel that way, then I'd live that way. Feelings are not the engine of the train, it's the caboose. Feelings are what happens, right, when we live well, when we have the confident expectation that Jesus is returning and he's going to restore this earth. That's our hope, the hope that the world is going to be better in in the future when Jesus returns. That inspires us to live today. And when we do that, the feelings come. And that's the order. We don't try to make our feelings first and live our feelings. We live in a confident expectation and watch how our feelings follow. And I saw that. I saw that in Africa this past year when I was there and some of these pastors and Christ followers were living great persecution and difficulty because Muslim people were preventing them from business and making it difficult for them to do things and how they would love even their Muslim neighbors, how they'd wash their feet, how they'd shepherd them. And they did it with such joy because they knew that one day Jesus was going to come and bring heaven on earth and they wanted to live out heaven today. Let me ask you, how are you living heaven today? How are people knowing you are a citizen of heaven because the values of heaven, the hope of heaven is lived out in your life today? Let's pray together. To Jesus, I just want to thank you that real hope is found at the intersection, at the intersection of our engagement with your word and in persevering through suffering with your word. And that, Father, we can do that. I pray, Lord, for all of us, that we would just open your word and say, this is your word for us. Speak to us. I pray for us that we would live out the word, even when it's difficult, even when the world is against us, and that we would live out the values of heaven, that we would not be pessimists, we would not be op- uh, optimists, but that we would be people of hope, and everyone would know. that They would go, that's what heaven is going to be like, because I see a taste from that person. And Jesus, I pray for those who've not received you yet. And if you are here, and maybe that's your life, maybe you feel like something needs to be restored in your life, something needs to be renewed in your life, then I pray that that you would invite Jesus in. He is the hope of restoration. He's the living hope. You can do that by saying, dear Jesus, I found no other hope. There's nothing else that gives me hope, but I know that you came, you lived, you died, you rose again. You promised to return. You promised to make all things right. You promised to restore the world world the way that it should be. And I'm going to focus on that hope of restoration. Jesus, come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Take charge of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet and my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, we faithfully bore. He canceled my death and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free watches over. 
cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with the freedom It's only because of the death and resurrection of Jesus that our life, it begins. And it's our prayer that you would know that life of Jesus and that Jesus, he would inspire you to live as a person of hope. I'm really excited that in a few weeks, June 20th, 21st, we're gonna reopen our campuses and have live worship services there, as well as our online services. You can go to our reopen page, go to calvary.church reopen. You can find all of the details that are there. And I'm sure, uh, like me, you just can't wait to come back and see people and worship together and sing as a community. And remember what it is to be a community of Christ followers together, loving God, changing lives, and transforming this community. God bless you. Go in His grace and peace.